Good morning, warriors. Hi, Claudia. Everyone doing okay today? Let's have a great week. Goldfinger, he's a man, the man with the Midas touch. Who's got the Midas touch in here? Anyway, I'm looking to fade Midas sometime this week. A lot's going to depend on the RSI reading, as you can tell. I mean, the momentum has been tremendous to the upside here. But uh, in form, I see a 1, a 2, and not a 3 yet, maybe 1420-ish, 14.17. But then you look at this chart and compare it to silver, and I keep waiting for the gold-silver ratio to shift, and it hasn't yet. So the weak sister is silver. So let me ask you guys a question. What's the safer short? This, and I'm not even doing it yet, or this? Okay, you want to short the relative weakness, right? Okay, so the relative weakness obviously is uh, silver. I'd like to see another high in silver, actually, because it peaked at, you know, 78. This time, I think if we pull back and do a little work and then make a move to the upside, it'll be different. So I have no fundamental reason for doing it. And, uh, you know, uh, weaker dollar, et cetera, weekly breakout, the whole world's long. Uh, one of the reasons, and, you know, maybe someone could verify it, one of my teammates or maybe some of you guys, is that the setup on COT right now in gold is pretty bearish. Commercials are pretty short. You know, and they were very long at the lows down there a year ago. So uh, I, I teach that, you know, you want to be on the side of the market with the commercials, but there's a difference between you and the commercials. You know what it is? Anyone know? Uh, they have deeper pockets by many zeros, okay? So they can afford to be early, plus they might be hedging inventory, et cetera. So, you know, it's a good thing to give you biases, but price action, like always, even against COT, rules. Everyone with me? Give me a why if you're with me on that. So you want to be on the side of the commercials and not the small specs or large specs, but uh, they have very deep pockets. Okay, so that can't be the only reason. So we'll see what kind of form we get on this. Um, so far, I, I've been pretty disappointed uh, with the action in the end, although they're trying to turn it. It's not going to take a huge week to get a reversal, but it's going to take quite a bit, 108.50. So, you know, we're 120 pips away. But you can say so far that we're putting in a higher low, right? And with the dollar making new lows, it's one of the only dollar pairs it's not. So I'm underwater from last week. I still own them. I haven't added and the and the reason is and looks like my reason is going to be tested because you know i'm looking for a turn in in this stuff okay so i think last week may have been it for a trough in the 10 year and if not the 10 year so here's a one hour see nice divergence down here but the 30 year even has a better pattern see this Anyone know what this is right here? Sorry about that. This little area here. Any guesses? Exhaustion? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's called an island. All right. This is the Grand Cayman Island that someone came to. And they got, they're starting to get island fever. And it gapped down to the island, the parachuted out of the plane to the island. And then the plane left, and here you are, you're on the island. And the market's leaving without you. So it's called, there you go, 
island bottom and bonds. So uh, I, I still think that this may have been the low, pretty classic if it happened around the Fed. This happened around the Fed. So, you know, everyone read into what the Fed said that, you know, the dot plots, uh, they're looking for two easings this year. So we'll see. It's a pretty contrarian call. Uh, if you did something like this, ABC, right? And, and I know Greg has been looking for this for a while. I'd be interested to hear what Greg thinks about yields right now. Um, that perhaps from here to here, we have some kind of fib retrace. Because I know TLT has been playing around with the 61.8 area. Let's see here. Do it from here. All right. I'm not getting all the fibs. Anyway, I, I would say right around 61.8, maybe 78.6. I don't think we're going to revisit these lows again. Uh, a lot of people are looking for... Uh, now that we're down to 2% and we're down to 2%, a lot of people talking one five yields I heard on CNBC, which is would be a record low. Well, not quite a record low. We were 130 back here in 2016. Well, if we had a move like this from here, I think it'd give us a 4% tenure. Okay, so uh, those are the things I'm looking at this week. Uh, one one last cross before I turn it over to the team, the best team on the net, is uh, Euro Pound here. I think there's a shot for one more high up here. We had a decent break from last week. My timing was messed up because I decided last Sunday to just have a piece on and then it was in my face. So I think I lost 28 pips on that. But I'd like to see one more shot to the upside for a three. It could be failing here, but I'm going to try and be patient. I don't know about you guys, but Mondays usually aren't the best day for me to initiate positions because sometimes you get a lot of follow through from the following week and you know my favorite day, right? What is it? Tuesday? I like Tuesday through Thursdays for trading, really. And Friday when there's NFP. And I love knowing what these guys are doing all the time. And I'm telling you guys, I'm not BSing you. People that have known me for a while, Ziggy, I bet you would attest to it. You were a you know regular attendee to on Lar on FX Street. Can you tell a difference since I've been here with Blake and the team, Zig? If you're here, anyone else who's been. Uh, following my Nostra Pinkert calls for a while. Anyway, you can't beat this team. And let's see. So if I told you that you could retain Blake for intelligence gathering, just Blake, all right, or Grega, when you total them all up for, I don't know, $15 a month, would you do a consultation with Blake Morrow? How about with uh, Gregor Horvath? Okay, there's 40 bucks. All right. On some macro, there's 60. Best review, great trader. He's given away so many great trades here in two and a half years, right? 100. I'm a host, uh, sometimes I'm funny, 10 bucks, 110. Joe's like me, we're promoters, uh, 10 bucks, Joe, <laughs> 120. Paulie's worth 20. 
he is so passionate about the markets. You could hear it in his voice. He's so excited to talk going through the bias chart. Amanda, 30 bucks for Amanda with her, you know, bearish cable work and everything else for quite some time. Andre, 20 bucks, Andre. You're 20. All right. Isn't it worth it? Okay. Anyway, just giving you an idea of the value. And really, the value is not in the website. It's who's creating the content for it. Don't you agree? I know how hard these guys work to keep the analysis up to date and push alerts to everybody. How are you, Blake? I hope you had a good weekend. I feel pretty tired this morning at four in the morning when my alarm went off today. Yeah, it's always rough in the morning on Mondays. How you doing? Oh, man. Okay. Pretty good. It was beautiful out here in Southern California. You know, you know, Blake, I dreamed of moving to California when I was in junior high. You dreamed of moving to California, but yeah, but, but when did, where were you? Chicago. Oh, oh, I, okay. I so I, I would have, I would have dreamt of moving to Alaska or anywhere out of yeah. Chicago. Well, you know, I'm watching the Rose Bowl with three inches of ice on my window. And, <laughs> okay. And seeing people out there getting a tan, I go, I, I'm moving there. And then Jan and Dean uh, sealed it with Surf City, two girls for every guy. So, <laughs> so, I left with a couple grand in my pocket at 22 in an old Cadillac. Oh, well, you know, that's the, that's the way to do it. Go West, young man. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I um, had a, my buddy um, who uh, had moved to San Diego. He actually moved to um, Oceanside in the... 80s so 80 84 85 he, he moved with his family calls me up on the uh on his graduation day he's like uh i got accepted to asu and i and i and when i picked up the phone he's like hey man i'm going back to phoenix i got accepted to asu i said that's funny i just got accepted in the marine corps i'm going to san diego for basic yeah, funny. training funny. <laughs> yeah and uh, and so we swapped spots. And yeah. He went to ASU, and I went to uh, well, I went all over the place. It was a lot nicer back then. Like it wasn't as populated. San Diego was. Oh yeah, now, you now know, it's like Orange County. Yeah, it uh, it's it's it it is definitely populated. Yeah. And yeah, you know, uh, oh, people country. people always look at uh, our real estate here in Arizona and wonder why prices have gone you know through the roof. And I think a lot of it is from the the overflow. Um, that you get in, uh, you know, from, uh, from, Cal. from California. Yeah. We get, uh, we get a lot of overflow there. Um, so anyway, I, I want to say good morning, everybody. Uh, and, and Dale, yeah, I, you know, there's a lot of times that I wish I was in Southern California. That's for sure. I, I, it's one of my favorite spots in the United States. Um, yeah. for sure. Um, now you were mentioning about uh, gold, and I I pulled up um, your, your Adam Momentum Capital. You've oh, interviewed okay. him before. Yeah, uh, yeah. Here's the free COT data. Uh, really interesting. I pulled up gold here because you mentioned that uh, you know. Um, yeah, people are telling me commercials have uh, a very large short. Position. Well, let's take take a look at speculators, and then you got producers and users here. Yeah. Which uh, you know they're they're relatively long. Spe they're bold up. Yeah. Speculators are long, and and so I don't know about you know as far as institutions are short, but they must be because if you got producers and users that are long and spec spectators uh, spec spectators speculators that are long, um, maybe that is true that institutional traders are short. Um, so, but uh, but the fact of the matter is gold's breaking out, and I am. Right. Um, uh, the DSI, if you guys missed it over the weekend uh, on my week ahead video. 125. No, it's 94, <laughs> 94, 97. It, it, no, 94. It's it's up there. And so, yeah, you, you know, I think gold's very bullish. I am not buying gold here. I, pl I played it to the long side three times last week and made money every time. I uh, did really well with it. Uh, and I do think it's bullish i just don't know if i'd want to be 
bullish right at this moment in time. I think that uh, the risk of a move uh, a move down in gold is quite high at this point intraday. I um, I would think that uh, that we either come down and reset ourselves here or maybe even break a little lower towards 1380 before making another move higher. Oh. Now, the obvious question I get from traders, this is the very first question that I get from people is, well, if, if, you're, if you're bearish intraday, does that mean you're going to short it? No, not necessarily. I, uh, I, I don't, when I'm as, as conviction long bullish as I am right now in gold, what I'm just looking for is I'm looking for a, uh, some sort of pullback to be long. Um, and, and this is, I, I had this conversation with, um, with, uh, Jack, uh, last week. He's, he's the young man that, uh, was, uh, if you guys don't know who Jack is and he's in our chat room now, uh, he, he's not in there today. Cause I think he's in Colorado at the moment, but anyway, his, uh, his father is one of the coaches for my baseball, for my son's baseball team, uh, my youngest son. And so I've known this family for five years or so. And, uh, and it just so happens that the young, the, the oldest son who's 17, no, 18, he got interested in currency trading like six months ago. And he's, um, he's been learning all he can. And, uh, we were talking, uh, at the end of the baseball season, the spring, uh, about currency trading and, uh, it just so happens that, you know, not very many of us live in the Phoenix area. Most people that our currency anybody's uh live in new york or london or whatever so uh he had he'd contacted or he you know it just so happens that uh, we all knew each other and um he wanted to come sit with me anyway he came and sat with me uh last week and then uh, a few weeks ago he sat with me for another week and so he spent a total of about two weeks with me for a couple hours a day uh young man 18 years old he would uh get up at four o'clock in the morning or three forty-five, and, uh, come to my office. And, you know, it's pretty cool to see a young, uh, pup get up that early and, you know, really put his best foot forward. So, uh, but we were talking about this dynamic last week of, of trading. Um, when, when, you know, I said to him that a lot of traders really, uh, get into trouble because they, they say, you know, uh, you know, you, they'd ask me a question, are you bullish, you know, the euro, for example, and this is an example, I'm just giving you an example here. Uh, are you bullish to euro? I would say no. Then why don't you short it? And I'm like, well, that's because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm you know, overall, I might be bullish to euro, but I don't want to, and I think it might be coming down near term, but that doesn't mean I want to short it. Um, and some people can trade both directions, but what I found is most traders are better when you find a trend or you find uh, something that you want to do and you look to play back into that trend. And that's the way I, I tend to trade the markets for the most part. Um, there are, you know, certain instances where I can trade either direction. I might find some sort of counter trend trade to do based on other reasons. But usually when I have a pretty bullish or bearish bias, I tend to stick with it. And like, for example, gold, I have a very bullish bias at the moment, even though I think it's near term, it's going to come down. Um, I'm, I overall want to be on the long side of that particular trade. So uh, the question is, will, will it, would I short gold right now? No, I won't. Uh, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for places to be long. So whether it's down here at uh, 1395 or whether it's down at uh, 1380, um, I, I'll get long. I just need to figure out you know, where the best place is. And, and usually the reason why I'm picking either here at this, this, you know, this trend line, or maybe even lower at the breakout point is usually has to do with some sort of correlations in the market. Um, you know, when I have some sort of correlated reason why I'm going to be doing that, uh, whether it's a macro development, whether it's a, you know, it's maybe other, um, asset classes tend to be moving in that direction. And that's why I want to do it. I don't know. I have to wait for it to get here. That's why I don't have like an open order to buy gold uh, at this moment. You know, I'm looking for, looking for reasons to be a buyer of gold and I'm just trying to find the right spot, which isn't at current levels, not for me anyway. Um, but anyway, I just want to kind of explain that dynamic because I think it's a good, 
it's a it's a good topic of conversation, especially when we've had such pretty big we've had big moves in in a lot of these pairs, and uh, you're probably looking for places to fade them. And instead of you know fading them if they're really strong, maybe the better thing to do is just wait for some sort of pullback. But it, that leaves us with periods of time where you may not be doing anything like i look at the euro dollar um you know a lot of people are looking at the euro as a short right now for me i think the euro is pretty bullish but we but i'm not going to ignore the fact that we're at 127 percent extension of this last move higher uh longer term we're at a 38 percent retracement of uh you know the highs back here in september of last year to the lows uh and and intraday we're probably you know pretty overbought look at the relative strength we're overbought i do think that we are also have an abcd um uh completion which you can see it's right here ab equals you know cd and i'm i'm using this this hourly you know a b c d at the 127 percent extension so yes you know, above 114, you might be able to take a counter trend short, but you got to ask yourself, how long are you going to stick around if you're going to do that trade? Um, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what, you know, how long will you, will you stick around in this trade if you're playing counter trend? Like for me, if I was trading counter trend the euro, I probably wouldn't look more than, you know, 15, 20 pips to get out of it. Uh, I So so with that being you're said- You're the antidote to FOMO. What's that? Your, your analysis is an antidote to FOMO for mm. people. Because uh, I mean, your whole presentation's about, you know, uh, all the crazy ideas that uh, people have uh, about, you know, counter trend. And, you know, you, you talk about how you don't have to trade counter trend and you could just wait for the market to come to you. So, well, you, well, you know, yeah, the, and, I, and I'm not saying that I don't, and, and, you know, I'll give you an example of a trade. There, there's one trade that I took this morning, the only trade I've taken this morning and, um, and, and coach that's the U S dollar Canadian. And I, I bought a little bit off of these lows and, and I, I, I bought, you know, 131.84. Yeah. Okay. And I'm up a few pips. Now, you know, the, the question is, and, and this is, you know, almost, well, this is, you know, yeah. pretty much the exact thing that I was just talking about. It's like, okay, if I'm going to trade counter trend, you know, I'm going to find, you know, currency pairs that have moved to levels that I think are, you know, overbought or oversold, like the, the dollar Canadian, for example. Yeah. We hit the 127% extension, a lot of divergence here. So I picked up the dollar Canadian down here yeah. and I put my yeah, stops. I like just, yeah, well, I just put my stops below the, 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 you know, today's lows. Could I get stopped out? Yes. Uh, is my conviction high? No. Um, do, did I take a big position? Absolutely not. Uh, I, and, and I got a question from one of our uh, traders in the chat room. Hey Blake, is this a longer term trade? And my answer was, I'll be lucky if I'm in this thing for more than an hour. I mean, that's, right. you know, I'm not going to stick around. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I might be able to squeeze out, you know, uh, 20 or 30 pips, maybe even make it all the way to 132.70. But, you know, I'm also looking at, you know, crude oil and I'm like, okay, well, crude, um, which has been really, you know, has had an, a decent bounce, might continue to stay weak though, uh, you know. It's, you know, here, here's a decent balance. So, you know, basically the message is lower your expectations on yeah. counter trend trades. Lower your expectations and really take smaller positions. I yeah, mean, if you're going to, if you're going to do it, like I'm in one third of my normal size trading the dollar Canadian long and I'm up what five or six pips. It's like, okay, well, you know, I, and, you know, I'll be lucky if I can take 15, 15 or 20 out of it and I'm taking a really small position. So am I going to, am I, is today the day that I'm looking to make, you know, a home run type of trade? No, it's not. Today is going to be, you know, counter trend consolidation, try to scalp a little bit in and in and out of the market. And uh, if I can make a few bucks, I'll do it. But um, I am not swinging for the fences today. That's for sure. Um, because, when when you are going counter trend, it is way more difficult to make money. What I what the better trade would be with the dollar Canadian, if you really think it's going lower, is you play the 
bare flag and you try yeah. to short the heck out of it at 132 and a quarter. Yeah. You know, that that right here is the the better trade in my opinion. And that's now, a fastball down the middle of the plate. And right now you're swinging at curves. I am. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to, you know, yeah. I am tr you know, Just if you're trying to make contact. Base, make contact. Yeah, if you're using the baseball analogy, correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and um, you Great know, mentoring place. Well, Thanks. But I, I mean, I just want to explain the difference between, you know, trading with the trend and maybe trading against the trend. I, uh, I, and, and, and I, I'm a really poor, piss poor counter trend trader. I'm just not very good. Uh, I tend to trade a lot better with the trend and, you know, you could argue with me. Um, well, Blake, well, if you're better at trading, you know, with the trend, why don't you just trade only with the trend? And that's, you know, this is, this goes back to what I was originally saying, you know, um, you, 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 you sure as hell can. And, and, you know, that's going to leave some days, uh, of inactivity. Um, and if you're willing to do that, then, then, uh, so be it. So anyway, um, uh, you know, nothing's really changed. Let me just really quick say this before, uh, Steve comes on. Because uh, I left them a lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of different currency pairs to go over. And obviously, if you guys want my analysis on on the pairs, uh, if you're you know a Forex Analytics subscriber throughout the course of the day and, and at the end of the day, if you're reading the basic technical analysis, you're going to find my analysis uh, throughout the course of the week. That's where I post all my analysis on all, all these particular pairs. Um, but... But uh, what I did want to say is not a lot's changed from the week ahead video uh, that I that I posted over the weekend. Uh, if you haven't watched that, make sure you do so. Uh, and and you know we have some pretty big breakouts that have occurred over the course of the last uh, last couple of um, uh, sessions that you have to really take heed of. And I and I think that uh, I think the euros. It, you know, going towards 114.50, if not higher. And uh, I, I just want to be able to play the euro on the upside on any, you know, s you know, any, you know, any, any deep dip. I'm looking, you know, 113.50 if I can get long. And I'm just hoping, hoping I can, you know, uh, trade it on the long side down there. I'm just hoping we get there. So anyway, um, you know, I'm, I, like I said, it's, 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 it's fairly slow. I wanted to leave a lot for Steve to cover this morning and uh, I'm going to bring him and Stelios is back from vacationing on uh, the, the, the islands of Greece. God, what a, what a crappy yeah, life not, that guy lives. I'm still away. Yeah. Yeah. I bet you're still, still waiting, at least in mind you are. How's not, not, not in body. So how are you guys doing? Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Stelios. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So Stelios, you finally got your, you know, your wet dream came true and uh, the precious <laughs> metals broke to the upside. Dale pointed out this morning, silver is a little bit underperforming and he rightly pointed out that, you know, silver is going to be the weaker of the two and silver is, you know, down on the day and, you know, dipping lower here. So what's your, what, what are you guys thinking about these precious metals moves? Well, personally, I think there is always a reason for a move and uh, we all know silver is an industrial metal. So it's not just a monetary metal. So when the, the global economy starts to turn lower, it will be affected. However, I still think that um, being a precious metal and this correlation with gold, it will eventually pick up. Very frustrating that it's not yet, but uh, I, I, I'm still long and I'm, I'm holding on to that. Okay. Long like Donkey Kong. Long. <laughs> Steve, Donkey Kong was even before your time as a gamer. Not actually. I remember myself at the age of like five playing on um, uh, those machines that they put in hotels, etc. Oh, well, you know, that, that, that means Dale was at least 70 at that point. So Prob probably 75. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, all right. Well, cool. Um, well, Hey guys, I'm going to pass it over to you. I just want to wish you all a wonderful trading session. I actually just got out of the dollar Canadian for 10. I, I took the, when the bid hit 94, I just hit the bid. So, um, yeah, see, that's how I'm trading counter trend on these, uh, on these trades. If I can, if I can make a few pips, I do it. And, uh, nice. Then I just uh, scurry off into a corner and you know wait for something else to develop. So, hey Blake, I, I'm still yeah. mastering Pac-Man. 
Uh, you, <laughs> good luck. You're going to be working Mrs. on that Buckman. one for the remainder yeah. of your life, I'm sure. All oh, right. look, he just ate another guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, an FX trader. It's FX <laughs> Pac-Man. <laughs> All right, guys, have a great one. Um, Thanks, I'll, and make sure you guys visit our webinar sponsor, yeah. Forest Park FX. And Steve, I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to you. See you, buddy. Okay. See you, guys. Okay, mate. Bye-bye. guys. Hey, Pac-Man. Okay. How's it going? Did you guys miss me? <clears throat> we uh, did. All I, oh you God. know how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. he, he, you know, he doesn't express his emotions that much. <laughs> uncomfortable with you know <laughs> tell stelios you love him steve prove me wrong. i love you bro oh man oh that's wow good. that's really that's what it. a moment <clears throat> so what so, do we do what what do you what's going on uh stell with boris johnson is he the guy well it looks like boris johnson and jeremy hunt uh boris johnson easily won in the <clears throat> excuse me in the um parliamentary vote but uh, the winner will be um, voted by the Conservative Party, not just the members of Parliament. This is a few thousand members, if I'm not mistaken. So um, he seems to be the hot favourite, but uh, it's not a done deal. But uh, well, I think we can assume that he will be the winner. Now, what is he going to do after that? Um, <clears throat> I don't think even he knows at this time. But um, what I want... Is I want to see movement. I want to see something different to what we've had for months now. And Theresa May, we can all agree. Oh, Simon says 160,000 members. Yeah, okay. There you go. Thank you, Simon. Um, what I want to see is I want to see some movement. I want to see something different. And um, uh, with Theresa May, I think we can all agree she was a bit of a mess in that, uh, in that respect. She always went back to the Europeans trying to get some kind of a concession and never got it and eff effectively bring the same deal to the table over and over again. Let's see what Boris Johnson can do if he has any kind of uh, leverage or uh, the fact that he's a little bit uh, um, um, unpredictable and, and some people say crazy, but you know, I'm not going to say that. Maybe that's going to um, scare the Europeans a little bit. Uh, you know, I doubt it, but um, you know, who knows? So that's what's happening in the UK. We have a little bit of... Um, uh, a little bit more waiting, but um, we should soon know the result. Uh, Trump says the U.S. needs rate cuts. Yeah, well, Trump would say of that. Of course, he? of course, it does. <laughs> and you know why, Celio? Why? Because he wants he's he's linked himself with the stock market, and he wants to. It has the strongest economy it ever had in the history. Yeah. That's why he, it's rate cuts. Yeah, but seriously, though, he has from day one... And if the economy cuts. becomes a little bit stronger through the rate cuts, then it will definitely also need QE. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, you can throw the economic book out of the window. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy what we're uh, living, but, um, but that's, uh, that's Trump. You know, uh, you did... want to know when you could really throw the economic book out the window? We were minutes away from war last week. You think so? Uh, I, I know so. I have my doubts. You do? You, you don't think that they were ready to go? And he called it off? No. I don't believe I that it. news. What, what no, do you think happened? No, they weren't prepared to strike? I don't really know. Prepared to strike. I bet they're always prepared to strike, you know, in that Area. No, I mean, they had gone out and said, you know, uh, people not to, no fly zones. Let me, let, me, let me say it oppositely. Trump doesn't strike me as the person that would care about 150 casualties to not, to, to call off uh, an airstrike. I'm I, not I think, saying that was the reason, but it, I, he still oh, called it oh, off. That's what you mean. I, I believe that the main reason is because they try to sell two different stories. The first one had to do with the uh, tanker. The second one had to do with the uh, shooting down of the drone, none of which really um, uh, moved, uh, you know, the viewpoint of the rest of the allies. So Why I allies? Think... It, was, it was the generals that didn't think it was a good idea that this is not Syria. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Plus, they, the Iranians uh, have been preparing their military yeah. since the Iran-Iraq war. And yeah, they've been yeah. fighting wars with proxy armies, and they're not going to be, uh, you know, it's not going to be easy 
okay, there's going to be repercussions. And what there's I'm no, worried about no now is no that about is, is that they bait him into a war, that they want the war. That's what I'm worried about. And I, uh, if, if he if they keep doing things, there's no way he's going to be able to just. I don't think anybody wants to take on the U.S. in anything yeah, military. Me I mean, too. Oh, I don't know. Well, but yeah, then, well, you know, I see, I see no real benefit from wanting to take on the U.S. Right? On the other hand, uh, the benefit not... is the apocalypse that they're all looking for and their imam <laughs> to come and rule the world. And, you know, I, I know you're laughing at it, but they will lay down their lives for that. Okay. Yeah, that's undoubtedly. Yeah. Okay, so um, that's it. I'm not saying any more. <laughs> but wait, actually, but everyone takes this so lightly, and it's not. Uh, maybe it's because people are nervous about it, so they want to laugh at it. But we were that close to war last week. All right, I'm going to take a break because my blood pressure is up. <laughs> Actually, you know what? This uh, shooting of the drone is good for the U.S. economy. You know, the more drones they shoot, oh, yeah, the more they get to they get to build. So yeah, more I, production. Yeah. We did logic. Let's have that's a great. because it boosts the GDP. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, like the Great Recession was great, <laughs> but not for you. <laughs> As you said, for times, anybody. Uh, and all yeah, the, not 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 for Greece either. They've had their great oh. recession for what about ten years now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but okay. we're the lucky ones. You're we've like never, Japan. You guys are like never, Japan. We never exited the recession, so you know, yeah, nothing, nothing to worry about. Yeah, the, the, you're used is, to it now. There is a Greek saying uh, that goes like, if I translate it, that if you are wet, you're not afraid of water. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good one. Man. Okay. Yeah. So, Stelio, that's it. That's it. Uh, we had Trump also threatening more sanctions on Iran. I don't know what's left to actually sanction. But, to uh, actually sanction, yeah. And I don't think that anybody cares or the market is going to move yeah. because of Sanctions on, on uh, Iran, you know, I don't even know if crude will move on mm. that. But if something moves, that, that's going to be it. Crude, by the way, has had, an, and we're going to visit crude. It's one of the uh, main charts we're going to look at today. Has had quite a strong move last week, undoubtedly. I, I still think in the grand scheme of things that move looks corrective. But, of course, you know, we, we, we need a little bit more price action to determine that with uh, certainty because that last leg higher has been strong. Now, starting from gold, gold obviously, uh, you know, has broken out. There's no question about it. I just wanted to show that I'm monitoring the extensions of this move lower within the triangle, the last, you know, big move lower within the triangle, and the 127% uh, extension comes at 1,422. So that's a possible area of a pullback that I'm looking at, you know, considering also that the RSI is as 85, at 85, etc. Keep in mind, though, that I'm not advocating for somebody to try to fade gold. I'm just saying that, you know, if you've been long, um, you know, I would be a little bit careful. We might see a pullback from there. I do think that as long as we keep trading above 1350, uh, 1360 dips should be bought. So the direction of the trend is until proven otherwise higher after, you know, breaking above a multi-year uh, triangle. So, you know, that's it with gold. Now having to do with silver, as, as I've been saying for weeks now, um, you know, is silver looking better? Yeah, it absolutely does. I mean, it has broken above this descending wedge. It's been moving higher. It did get rejected at the end of last week from the 61.8 of that last move. Um, uh, lower, uh, but you know, I wouldn't spend more time analyzing silver just to say here also that um, 15 dollars, 10, 15 cents, somewhere there is an area of support. Uh, we might be seeing a short term consolidation, like a little triangle manifesting here before moving higher. But as long as the gold silver ratio keeps pushing to multi year, almost to all time highs. Um, you know, you have absolutely no reason to be looking to buy uh, gold, uh, sorry, silver against gold because gold is overperforming at the moment. And as you see, the gold silver ratio is in a very strong uptrend. So if you want to be <clears throat> long until proven otherwise, I think that gold should remain the uh, vehicle of choice. And now, on the other hand, if you want to have exposure in a metal that is also um, associated, you know, with risk appetite, then palladium is the way to go. Palladium remains very well bid as well. At some point, it should have some, some kind of a little pullback, but I do think that's 
in buy the deep mode as well. Um, Copper, one last uh, to show before we switch to another category of charts. Copper still finding it a tough breakthrough. This confluence of resistance is at 272. Um, so, you know, I would be a little bit skeptical here. Buying against resistance doesn't make much sense. There is still a chance that this is some kind of a bear flag and we might move lower from here. Um, in any case, uh, you know, it seems to be uh, holding close to resistance. So, you know, the fact that initially getting rejected from here hasn't um, accelerated the metal lower is something that, is, that should also be taken into account, but I wouldn't be trading it at current levels one way um, or another. Uh, stocks, very briefly here, uh, consolidation near all-time highs uh, for the S&P. You know, clearly there is no reason to try to fade it yet, right? NASDAQ, same deal, not at all-time highs, but, you know, we're getting very close and I find it very likely that we're going to end up, um, you know, registering fresh all-time highs here as well. DAX, finding resistance at previous resistance area, but still keep in mind it has broken above, the, above this uh, bull flag. So I do think that, you know, respecting the upside is the way to go. Same deal here after this little pennant, not so little anyhow, this pennant for the FTSE. In general, as you see, stocks remain quite well bid. And let's go to crude. Crude, obviously, uh, another tailwind for crude is, uh, you know, having strong risk appetite. We know that usually there is a strong correlation between um, the S&P, for example, and crude. So as long as the indices are doing well, it's one extra reason uh, for crude to be rebounding. The other, of course, and, and the main one is the dollar moving lower. And I'm going to go to the dollar index just after showing this. Crude has rebounded quite strongly. But keep in mind that this 58, uh, 57, 50 to 58, 50 area is an area of resistance. Keep also in mind that the 200 DMA is also approaching this area as long as the 50 DMA, the 50% FIB is also at 58.50. Bottom line, be a little bit careful here, buying against you know so many resistances that are you know cluttered within less than a dollar, um, you know might not be such a good idea. That's why I think that this area is a key area to to watch, you know, it's going to help us determine what's, hap what's happening from um, from this point. Even if we get rejected from there, though, keep in mind that 54, 50 to 54, 75 might act as support. So, you know, there might be, even if this is a corrective move, it might prove being, you know, a little bit more complex, right? Very frequently, corrective moves have, you know, an element of complexity to them. Uh, impulsive moves usually are, you know, much more straightforward, very easy to read. Um, so, you know, something like that, for example, might uh, play out here. Now, um, having said that, let's have a look at, you know, what is the market focused more most on at the moment, which is the dollar index. So, first of all, the dollar index has definitely broken down. Now has broken down below this channel as well, below the 200 daily moving average below the 61.8 of that last move um, higher. So multiple areas of support have now been breached. Um, and I do think there is more downside to come. That is why I was looking after the Fed for an opportunity to sell some dollars. I did so. Um, I did sell the dollar against the Norwegian kroner, kroner that is moving quite nicely. I'm going to show it uh, just after this. Um, obviously, crude rebounding is helping as well. So next area of support here for the DXY is, you know, this low at 95.03. Um, I do think that we're going to test that area. I do think that we might even bridge through that area. I do think that this whole move higher might even prove to be corrective. So, you know, in general, I'm, I'm quite bearish the dollar, especially now that we have a reason to be so. Uh, you know, having said that, I'm you know, taking it one day at a time. So I am now actively looking for pullbacks to sell more dollars against, you know, more currency pairs. Um, so keep in mind that any rebound of the dollar, uh, I'm, I'm looking at it as a 
corrective move in the short term. Okay, that is a given now. In I mean, this is how I'm I'm now wired. Um, I do think more weaknesses uh, ahead for the dollar. Uh, even if this is a corrective move, keep in mind that it can go on for several weeks, right? So that is something to consider. Speaking of, um, you know, a possible uh, rebound in the dollar, as you see, uh, the cable is finding once again a resistance at this area, this 20, 127.50, area, uh, you know, being resistance once again. Um, this is one of the reasons why uh, I would be willing to buy, um, you know, several pairs or several, uh, you know, um, assets against the dollar. But I'm still very, very skeptical about uh, cable. I think I, I, it's obviously still underperforming. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's no reason to gamble with that. So keep in mind, cable is at resistance at the moment. For me to become more constructive, I would want to see a clear break above this um, area, which, you know, for the time being uh, is not happening. Even the RSI rebound so far isn't really showing any uh, momentum that would, you know, make me want to buy it. Now, um, the USD knock. Yeah, I said about the USD knock. So USD knock has broken down below this confluence of supports at 860. Uh, next area to watch is 840. And, you know, below that, things become uh, a lot more dicey for the bulls because uh, keep in mind that, you know, this area is also uh, this multi-year corrective move lower, uh, previous resistance. Um, so I wouldn't want to see if I was long the pair break down below this and within this uh, descending channel because I think that then we might be seeing a lot more weakness. Having said that, since I think that crude might be in a corrective move, um, you know, if, if crude finds uh, some kind of a, a high, um, you know, that will help uh, use the knock uh, hold this 840 area. Irrespective of that, I do think that 840 is going to act like a magnet so, um, you know, I'm still holding on to my position. I think that I'll have uh, an opportunity to take it out uh, there. My entry is a little bit higher than 870. So, you know, it's going to be a good trade if we make it all the way down there. Now, the rest of the commodity currencies are still not convincing, in my opinion. For example, OK, we see this rebound uh, for the Aussie. Uh, after, you know, incrementally posting new lows from a previous horizontal support area. But once again, as I was saying the previous time we were rebounding, I can't really, you know, turn bullish as long as this 70-30 area is still holding as resistance. Now, obviously, if, if uh, the dollar, uh, you know, keeps uh, moving lower at some point, this is going to happen. But until that happens, um, you know, I'm going to remain quite skeptical in uh, in this move. So, you know, I'm not close to actually buying the Aussie. And as a matter of fact, Kiwi, more or less the same deal. You can see it here. Previous time we found we found the resistance a little bit lower than the area I was looking for, 67, 10, uh, sorry, 10 was the area. Um, you know, we found the resistance a little bit lower, like 10, 20 pips lower. Once again, we're rebounding from a previous low. This is going to be an interesting trade because if we actually make it up there and we actually break above 67.10, then we're going to have in hand a double bottom um, formation. So then I'm going to be more than happy to actually buy the Kiwi, looking for an extension towards 69.50 or so. Uh, but until that happens, uh, I'm looking at this as a range, you know, because until proven otherwise, that it is that is what it is. Okay, now having to do with the use the CAD. Blake already covered that. Um, I do view this consolidation, the use of the CAD as corrective. So I would love to sort the rebound as Blake was showing. Uh, I wouldn't be trading it counter trend. That I, and I think that Blake did the right move for scalping it for 10 pips and, you know, getting out of it. Um, because it's, it's quite dangerous, in my opinion, being long. It can rebound from there, but it's quite dangerous. Um, let me go through some of your questions and get some ideas. Da -da -da -da. Hi, Steve. What's your opinion on euros in Euroki? Sure. Let's have a look at them.
So, Eurozy, Euro Kiwi, last week, they posted some very interesting reversal candles. You can see it here, for example, if I zoom in, you can see this candle here. That was a beautiful key reversal. So far, it hasn't been invalidated because we haven't traded above its uh, spike high. But this is not the price action that we want to see. Okay, so I'm not taking it any more seriously into consideration after seeing the candle that we had on Friday. Uh, keep in mind, so keep in mind, you know that it remains euros. It remains very well bid. It might as well even extend to fulfill this bull flag because don't forget this is a you know textbook bull flag that we had marked on the chart and by definition this bull flag has a target at 166.30 so you know since that key reversal so far doesn't look like it's going to be playing out we might extend to test that previous spike high we might even extend to a new high to fulfill this uh bull flag okay so you know I'm, I'm i won't be buying them here but i'm telling you that so far it looks like they might have more upside same deal with the euro kiwi very nice reversal last week but it immediately found support at the horizontal support resistance area and you know friday it had a good day which means that you know it remains constructive and the next upside area is this horizontal uh, support resistance area at 174.30. So it is what it is. I mean, momentum has definitely slowed, but, you know, they remain in, in an uptrend. Now, at some point, you know, sooner rather, rather than later, I do think that we're going to, you know, have a reversal and, you know, see them actually, uh, you know, move, um, you know, lower in... A big corrective move, even you know, an impulsive turn, uh, but we're not there yet. Pound Aussie and Pound Kiwi, though, I have to admit, are in a totally different situation because, for example, you can see as Euro Aussie is threatening with a break of new highs, Pound Aussie so far isn't convincing that this rebound higher is not simply corrected because it has all the corrective characteristics you expect to see. I mean, the move is like slow, overlapping. Choppy, and after so many days, it has just retraced 38.2% of uh, the last move lower. So pound those, it definitely looks more bearish and, you know, the same deal uh, here with uh, pound kiwi. So definitely, if you're looking to short some of those, I, I would be looking towards the pound pairs. And one extra element to point in that direction is the fact that I had actually envisioned a move like that in the euro pound and it worked quite nicely up to the point that it was getting rejected from that area that confluence of resistances but the move lower found immediately support the first support area and now it looks more like a consolidation near the highs so i would be quite careful here because the euro pound doesn't look like it wants to you know seriously move lower and as long as it doesn't um you know, it's it's logical to expect that the pound crosses are going to underperform the, the euro crosses. Okay. Now, keep in mind, though, even if we break above this area, we have this multi-month channel, you know, descending channel. Its resistance currently passes from 90 cents. So, you know, just 50 pips above where we currently are. We have this trend line resistance, which, you know, is quite important so i would be uh, quite careful now if we slice through that i think that euro pound is headed much much higher okay so keep that in mind i wouldn't be trying to fade the euro pound if we actually make it above 90 cents um i will be actually looking for it to extend higher and perhaps even accelerate and you know gain more uh momentum let me go through The rest of your questions in the chat. Use the Swiss, absolutely. Use the Swiss is one of the pairs I was very actively looking for. I would have actually traded the USD Swiss uh, because I was, you know, a strong believer that it's going to break down. What held me from doing so, and perhaps, you know, mistakenly, I mean, I should have anyhow taken the trade, most likely. 
uh, is the fact that we had this false break lower and then we moved back higher once again. This really, you know, uh, made me more skeptical because other than that, I really liked the momentum we had lower. Uh, I liked this move higher as a corrective one because it has all the corrective characteristics. So I was really expecting for it to break down. Uh, as I said, though, I didn't trade it because of this false break low, break lower, which made me very skeptical following that. Now, after getting rejected from this uh, parity area, uh, as you see, the momentum has been very strong since. So I do think that the USD Swiss remains uh, a pair that should be sold on rally. So, for example, this 98.50 area, which I was looking, I was writing in the chat room that I was looking for it as a target. If we actually break lower um, on a four-hour chart, we had an ascending wedge here. So that that is what I was looking for, for a full retracement of that wedge, which you know which should should have brought price action back to 98.50. Um, should act as resistance from this point on. So, in my opinion, any rebound towards 98.50 is a good opportunity to sell the pair. And look for another leg lower towards the 61.8 of this, you know, larger move. Uh, currently, you know, currently at like 95.88. Okay, so that's what I think about the US this race. Definitely a sell on rallies uh, until proven otherwise. We have the divergence on RSI for uh, EA. The EA is uh, Eurozy. Yeah, that might be the case, but keep in mind that sometimes. RSI divergences need some time, some time to play out. Okay, as I said, I wouldn't be buying the euros here, but that doesn't mean that it can't move higher before it actually rolls over. Okay, the fact that we are also seeing this divergence between the pound crosses and the euro crosses, meaning the pound crosses seem to be rebounding in a corrective manner, while euro crosses seem to be pushing the highs. Uh, also makes me skeptical because yes, this comes from the fact that euro is overperforming the pound as we saw in the euro pound. But keep in mind that euro cannot really be diverging for a long period of time, and you know significantly diverging from what what the pound is doing. So this divergence that euro Aussie and euro kiwi are uh, you know toying around with posting. Um, you know, new highs while pound Aussie and pound Q are far away from that uh, is also signal, in my opinion, that Euro Aussie and Euro Q might turn lower in the very near future. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's going to happen immediately. Okay, so if you're looking to trade on an RSI divergence and, and on a divergence between the Euro and the pound crosses uh, with, a, with a tight stop loss, I think it's a mistake. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, we also have a question about the Aussie Kiwi, which just came in. My opinion is that the Aussie Kiwi has a decent chance of pushing higher once again. And the reason I'm saying that is because after breaking higher from this descending wedge, we had certainly a very strong move higher. Within a few days, we covered you know quite a lot of ground. And following that, we have had a very slow and choppy move lower. So in my opinion, this is an impulsive move higher and this is a corrective move lower, which means that even if this whole thing is part of a corrective move higher, it's missing one leg. Uh, one leg that would probably bring the pair on this significant uh, confluence of resistances above 108 at 108 30 108 50 okay so bottom line i think that there is a very very decent chance that Aussie Kiwi is going to break above this descending channel and push higher once again 108 108 50 would be my target in that case but this move hasn't started yet okay uh, another question about economic news for today. Very short, very you know, light on economic news today. Uh, Coach, do we have an interview today, by the way? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. I think I've covered all the questions. We're just one minute away from the top of the hour. So if your guest, if your guest is here, I see no reason why you can't start. Okay, thank you, Steve. 
again, hey, once again, a great roundup of everything that's happening. As you can tell, Steve's not afraid to express his opinions with conviction. Ah, speaking of which, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, sorry. I remember that there was one pair I specifically wanted to talk about, <laughs> and I didn't do so, and that is the USD SEC. Time's uh, up. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I forgot to show it on Friday, actually, and oh, I yeah. almost forgot to do it today as well. The reason I wanted to show it on Friday is because on Friday, Breakdown. we were breaking down yeah. from this ascending wedge, and a very nice ascending wedge. I, I would almost describe it as perfect. And by With perfect, a throwover on top. Exactly, too. because yeah. by perfect, I'm throwing the element of the, I'm putting in the element of the throwover, exactly yeah. as you mentioned. Yeah. So a very nice ascending wedge had its throw over as well, which very frequently, you know, is like the last hurrah to, you know, get people, get bands off yeah. the market and get people long at the worst possible point. Right. So mean Mr. Opinion, market. It oh, keeps, yeah, exactly. It keeps trying to fool people. Too. Exactly. So in my opinion, another <laughs> pair that is very interested, an interesting, uh, in, you know, the way it's positioned, it has a very interesting structure. And definitely one of those that I'm actively looking to sell any rallies is the USD SEC. So that's why I wanted to show it. Thank you, coach. Nice trade, Paul. Real nice trade. Okay, Karush, I'm promoting you to panelist. And I'm going to see if I have you muted. I'm going to unmute you. And you'll also have control of the screen. You're probably too young to remember outer limits, but you're taking control of our television set right here. And really nice to meet you. Welcome to Face Karush. So you'll see. Uh, hello. Hi, there yeah. you go. Hi, Karush. Oh, awesome. Um, hi, uh, thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed the show up until now. Oh, okay. Well, it's only going to get better now. Because you're with me. <laughs> sure I can talk so, that. <laughs> all right. So uh, you can uh, screen share. So if you just hover your mouse over that, it'll say share screen. And then we could see your setup in different mark, uh, you know, see certain charts, whatever's on oh, your radar while we're talking. Yeah, there's a green share button. Just click on it and it's going to ask right, you if yes. you want to take the screen from me, usually you say yes, and then it's going to, uh, you know, make you choose which, which screen you want to share. There we go. Perfect. Come Perfect. Awesome. Can oh. everyone see my screen now? Got yeah, it. yeah. Yeah. We have uh, XTB. So we're going to be talking crypto. So I want to start here with you, Karusha. How long have you been doing this? Um, well, uh, yeah. Uh, reason we got crypto up is because, I mean, that's what got me into it about okay. 2.5 years ago now. Okay. All right. 2.5 years ago. So uh, tell us uh, what you were doing before that and uh, what it was uh, two and a half years ago that had you start to look at charts and, and trade the markets. What were, what's your background before you became a trader? Uh, awesome. I'd love to. Uh, so I did, was heavily into my mathematics uh, at university. Um, that was my passion for a while. And then um, started a business while I was at university. One of my friends got me into it. Um, it went well, got a little lucky. Um, and then from there, pretty much would jump from business to business, uh, buying and selling things similar to trading, but out there in the world. And okay. um, eventually around 2016, uh, one of my close friends who works at one of the banks involved with, I don't know if you were familiar with the um, Ethereum Enterprise Alliance. Okay. I'm not, I'm uh, familiar with Ethereum a bit. I mean, uh, uh, I, I, well, uh, this was, uh, I'm not too, too into the fundamentals, but what's at the time, this was um, a whole bunch of banks that were in some way getting very involved in Ethereum. And he, had a bit more information than most on it. He told me, you should check out this crypto stuff. And I'm pretty sure you know how it went from late 2016. Uh, the and then from years. there, I got very much into crypto. I saw the numbers going up and I thought, wow, this is incredible. And bear in mind, before this, um, I was very into investing, 
But to me, technical analysis and trading was absolute voodoo. Um, I did not think any of it could possibly work. Why? With um, a math background, I'm a little surprised at that because uh, the market is geometry in many well, ways, isn't it? Um, now, I would com completely agree with you that it, the mathematics is just um, ingrained into it. Every single tool has, every single the whole use universe has, is ingrained with it. So, um, right? Couldn't disagree with you there. Um, yeah. My, the, I thought there were too many variables. So, um, what, one of my mathematics background was specifically statistics. And one of the most difficult things um, in statistics is multivariate analysis. So in my head, there were far too many variables to possibly be able to um, pin them down and be able to make accurate predictions off of them. So every strategy I used in trying to benefit of the market was extremely passive. Okay. Okay. So you're, and what, uh, what brought about the paradigm shift and the breakthrough that technical analysis uh, had validity, although plenty of variables and interpretations with this, you know, to me, it's not the candlestick. It's who's viewing, mm -hmm. it's who's, who's looking at it. It's not the vehicle, um, it's who's driving the car. So uh, let me ask you this, what convinced you that you could look at candlesticks like you were showing us right now and uh, that it was less variable and it was worth risking capital on? Um, so at first, my reasoning was uh, how a lot of people get into the markets. I got in at a bull market. I had a few lucky trades and I thought I was a genius. Uh, I think every trader has that moment um, where they're like, oh, I am a genius. I can predict this. So I, I would look at the candles and think, oh, maybe I am clever because I'm making so much money. Um, and then a couple losses kick in and you start realizing the game isn't that easy. Um, I went back to passive and then what was my shift was I actually managed to find a few traders on Twitter who um, seem to be consistently putting out um, profitable trades using uh, systematic approaches. So something that is repeatable and you could create valuable data out of. And the way they were doing who were it they? was just... Sorry? Who were they? Um. Okay, so there were quite a few just in the whole space. And um, some of my earlier ones, um, I don't want to mention by name because looking back now, I think they weren't the most honest traders. They were just portraying certain, they, they were marketing it well. Um, oh, were they uh, who, show them uh, with pictures get, uh, driving their Ferrari and getting on private jets? Um, smarter ones than that. So okay. those I would, it wasn't falling for. It was okay. more ones that um, would. Okay, who do you respect? Okay, we know there's plenty of charlatans out there. Uh, uh, who did you learn yeah. from that you still have respect for? Oh, um, well, for that, I would love to. There's, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Trading Room app on Twitter. He's a pretty big handle who um, promotes trend trading quite strongly. Um, watching a lot of the things he did, um, I, he? I sorry? feel like a dentist trying to get a, the name out. Who is he that has trading? Is that trading room channel? app? That is his name. Um, Tra trading room app. If I, I'll Tra type at trading room app. Okay. Uh, who else? So he, um, the trading room app was a great trader who I learned a lot from. Another one who was really good. I found a guy named um, Smart Contractor um, and a few others who used um, Elliott Waves. And although I'm not an Elliott Wave trader myself, as you said earlier, with mathematics being ingrained in reality, I knew how deep Fibonacci numbers ran in everything. Yeah. And when I saw this system revolving pretty much around using them for yes. reading people's psychology and the aesthetic geometric movements of the market and certain patterns. I was drawn into believing a little more into technical analysis than before, because I realized you can just, like you said, look at the candlesticks, isolate the data that's important 
and not get into immensely complex multivariate analysis where you have to bring in um, every single piece of information. Any books that influenced you on trading that you've read? Um, so two I enjoyed quite a lot. One of them would be um, Market Wizards, interviews with top traders. Yeah, uh, yeah. That I've one, interviewed Schwager quite a few times. Have you really? I need to go out of my way to watch that. Um, maybe but, he'll be, yeah, maybe, book, he'll inter maybe in his next book, he'll include you. Um, well, I mean, I'm still uh, a guppy. I'm kidding. Well, only 2.5 years. It's something to shoot for. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah, so you love Market Wizards and uh, what else? That's what I really enjoyed. And Trading in the Zone. Oh, for, yeah, it's a uh, very good book. Okay, see, that, so, that, go yeah, ahead. please. Go ahead. Um, I was going to say Psychology of the Game. That's what um, yeah. took me to a consistently profitable trader from just a gambler, an occasional um, speculator. Okay, so uh, what are we looking at here? And, uh, uh, you know, it looks like, uh, I don't know what moving averages you're using here, but way above all of them. And uh, I had Mark Yusko on, if you're a crypto guy, uh, Mark's a, a great ambassador for Bitcoin. And he said, nothing good happens underneath the 200 day moving average and everything good <laughs> happens above it. So uh, what are we looking at here? Um, so right now we have the seven, the 20, the 50 and the 200. Okay. So we're pretty, pretty solidly above the 200 over here on the one week. And actually we'll go a little lower onto the 12 hour. Um, and well, this is pretty much the core of my trading. It's, uh, as I said earlier, I like to isolate data, um, not have too much information. I deliberately try to actually ignore macro events, um, except enormous game-changing ones like key exchanges going down, um, and try to focus on the data as much as I can. I use the moving averages to determine a trend. Um, here are a few. I don't think it's actually hugely important which moving averages you use because at the end of the day all they're doing is figuring out how much the price has deviated from the mean so as long as you have them spaced out you can see the level of deviation from the mean price and in which direction we are deviating how did so, your chart serve you from the high late last year uh, uh to the lows that we finally got this year uh, from the blow off top, uh, were you playing the short side? Did you move to cash or uh, did you give up gains? Um, so what I was doing was I was controlling my Bitcoin exposure throughout the whole time um, by rebalancing constantly. So uh, I treat my investing and trading completely separately. So with the investing side, I was passively entering pretty much um, from the top. So every week I would passively buy the same amount of Bitcoin with as far as my investing is concerned. So and you then, scaled in um, all the way down? Uh, pretty much scaled in all the way down and I increased my ingression um, as we got lower and lower. So once we broke the 6K re resistance, I increased my aggression by 20% and increase by aggression, not the absolute amount, but the relative amounts given to other places I was funneling, uh, compared to other places I was funneling my money into. Okay. Um, and so, so how did the you reason, handle the heat? Uh, sorry? So, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure there were, did you have periods of self-doubt doing that? Especially if you started scaling in, uh, you know, above 10,000, did you have some uh, um, trepidation at all, or you were just had so much conviction that we were going to bottom at three and turn that you'd be okay. So I was ready. For, so my theory with Bitcoin is that the long-term trajectory was going to be upwards. Um, I did believe fundamentally in cryptocurrencies and that they would serve a very strong purpose in the future. I had a lot of people a, a lot smarter than me and heavily involved in the space who had given me convincing arguments, which I could not disprove. Um, so I believed not necessarily in Bitcoin, but cryptocurrencies as a whole. And the best 
vehicle to passively invest into it for me was Bitcoin. So if I wanted exposure to this industry, which I thought was going to blow up, the best way to do it was just Bitcoin until another coin overtook it. So I was very much ready to jump ship if something managed to overtake Bitcoin. But as long as Bitcoin maintains its dominance, it's the best place to expose yourself, at least from an investing standpoint, to Bitcoin. What's been your worst drawdown? Uh, sorry? What's been your worst drawdown? Um, so my trading has actually luckily not gone through a big period of drawdown yet because I've started you're investing. Off in so the- you're, you're, you're distinguishing between what you did on the way down to your trading, right? That wasn't trading. No, that yes. was investing. Yes. Yeah, so with investing, I refer to the way I distribute my net worth and expose myself to different assets. With trading, I have specific okay. portfolios that follow different systems. Okay. So, um, you know, I'm just saying that because I know guys that were day traders yeah. and the day trade didn't work. So then it became a swing trade. <laughs> then they became a position trader and eventually an investor. Uh, so no, absolutely not. My investing oh, is completely okay. separate. Uh, uh, you're laughing. You're laughing. So uh, w- why is that funny to you? Have you ever seen that? Um, definitely seen that all the time. <laughs> um, okay. Anyway, a day I mean, trade um, turns into an, an investment in a hurry in this business. Anyway. I've seen some day trades. So I've had messages of um, million dollar portfolio turning into a, now this is not an exaggeration, $10,000 um, investment. Yeah. So um, I, I have seen uh, the actual absolute extremities of that. Um, the reason I differentiate, because when it comes to my trading, it's completely different because I am a day trader. I don't um, particularly take um, the longer, the, the larger swing positions as much. Um, yeah. Though recently I have been, um, doing it with Bitcoin. Uh, my main method of trading is one. So I have two main systems. One of them is trend trading, where I find explosive trends on altcoins and uh, scale in on key supports and scalp for a quick profit. And the other method I like to use, which I don't do as much anymore, is I used to be a very aggressive counter trend trader, but the stress was just not worth it because of how volatile and extreme it can be counter trend trading on five 30 minute timeframes. Yeah. A lot of noise. So, uh, everything we talked about is pretty much yesterday's newspaper buddy. So what, a, uh, I guess a big question for crypto guys and almost, a, I've had universal response, uh, is this bounce that we've had from earlier in the year in crypto, uh, just a retracement of the prior decline or the beginning of a bull, a new bull market. And if you believe that, why? Um, well, I would think it's more likely to be the beginning of a new bull market specifically because, um, for a retracement, I was not expecting us to blast through this enormous area of, demand turned supply this easily. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, my mouse is. That's okay. Skip that. Yeah. There we go. So, so if so, you had fresh money right now, would you just launch and get long here? What do you do? Mm, not specifically launch and get long. If this is the start of a new bull market um, and I wanted to start buying in, I wouldn't buy at this very moment right now. Um, I would go to either the daily or the weekly and take some key moving averages. So say the seven, the 20 and the 50. Um, and I'll I would try confluence. Uh, sometimes they come together and it, uh, have you noticed confluence of your, on your moving averages sometimes, uh, is an so, even more powerful magnet. Um, so specific confluences, which I really like is, um, when we have periods of con- consolidation to wait for the seven moving average, 
to mm -hmm. break the resistance. So if we take a look over here, I see. Um, let the price break through. Mm -hmm. I see that. So let the price break through first, but don't right. enter then. Wait for the seven moving average to go through. And that's um, my bull trap, prote um, bull trap protection. Okay, um, because, it looks like a three drive to a top formation to me. So, uh, well, what I'm would, not familiar with that form of trading, but if well, it is that, take a picture. Yeah, take a picture then. Um, let me ask you this: So, you're talking about uh, where you'd be looking for pullbacks in Bitcoin. Do you think that pullback? Someone told me about uh, Ghost Month in August, and Asia is a big participant in uh, crypto. Do you believe that? Uh, we get that kind of seasonality weakness as they restrain from investing during that month because the ghosts might scare them? So I do not doubt that it's po possible, but um, <laughs> like I said, you, I, have, you know about ghost month though, right? Um, I do not know about ghost month. I'd love oh, okay. to All right. learn more about that. Okay. Well, you, you take a sheet off your bed <laughs> and you wear it over your head for 30 days. That's ghost month. No, I think it's some type of uh, uh, spiritual or superstition that happens in Asia. I, I didn't know about it till a week or so ago, but uh, I, what, I, would be, what would be some levels that would be attractive? Uh, obviously, uh, you could go all the way down like a pullback to 8,000 or 6,000, or maybe we'll never see that major break where we have that major breakout again. 5,800 would be a gift, wouldn't it? Um, absolutely. I never like to say never, but I'd be very surprised um, to see us go to these lows ever again. Um, okay. But again, there are no absolutes in the market. Our job is to just predict yeah. what we think is going to happen and is probable and then make a play off of that. Do you have any so, long-term targets in Bitcoin? I know some people are talking in uh, 30K or so for the next um, wave. I don't even want to guarantee that there's going to be another all-time, there's not going to be, there's going to be an all-time high with this specific run. Um, I'm a very apathetic trader. So with regards to this, what do I see right now? I okay. see an extremely strong uptrend. I yeah. see that dips are for buying. So I'll identify key res uh, key supports. So if we have a resistance and we break it, that's a reversal. That's a good chance to make a play here. Um, target the upside more aggressively, but I'm not trying to predict how high this move is going to go. I'm a scalper. I'll buy the supports. I'll sell at a greater profit than I've been risking and continually do that all the way up. And that's what the trading's doing. With okay. regards to the investments, I don't need this to be another all-time high. As long as the long-term trajectory continues to go upwards and I just average in, it will keep making money. So I don't need to or think it's um, a wise strategy for myself to be trying to predict whether this is going to go to 15K and go back into a bear market or it's going to go to 40K. Okay. Um uh, why are you on social media? Do you have a business model or do you mentor, teach? Uh, what's your uh, motive behind being on platforms such as Twitter? Oh, so um, I started uh, it as a way to journal um, a new system I was trying out on a portfolio. So I would just post every single trade um, I was doing live mm -hmm. and it got some traction. People started following me. Um, I then posted a few educational videos and people liked it. Um, and I personally was really enjoying it. Um, it's very fun place to be involved in. I don't particularly do any um, paid services. Uh, I ran one small test group last year of a few people I wanted to mentor with my specific systematic style of trading. And um, it went pretty well. Um, nine out of 10 students are very happily trading profitably. Um, the other one isn't, um, fully committed to his trading and has actually started another successful business, but it was very fun, but not something I wanted to pursue any further. So right now I'm just on social media because I really enjoy it. 
I love interacting with people. I love meeting traders such as yourself with 30 years of experience um, and growing and learning from them. So okay. yeah, no particular business model. I just really enjoy it. Um, it's very fun. And where do you trade yeah, from? Just, What's a, where do you trade from? Um, so I use Kraken and no, Binance. I mean, geographically. Oh, from London. Okay. All right. So uh, you're going to stick around after a hard Brexit or is the, the whole financial world going to uh, across the pond? <laughs> um, I mean, I, it's a difficult one because I do, I was very much opposed to Brexit. Um, I didn't like the idea at all. I don't personally like the idea of borders full stop. So I'm going to stick around after Brexit because it is my home and I do love it, but I'm not going to be happy about it. Um, I think it's, I don't like the idea of borders in general. The EU was a very nice um, non-segregator, if you will. Um, just these general tensions and conflicts between nations drive me a little crazy. I saw you mention earlier in the podcast about Iran and uh, America, which, yeah, pretty much on the brink of war and people didn't realize really. Yeah. So uh, may, uh, Shakespeare said, I believe, may you live in interesting times. So what you, you yeah. picked a great time to be in the market, a whole new asset class that's become a tradable thing. And, and you trust Kraken to leave large deposits in there or do you drain your account because you're worried about uh, the fact that they're unregulated? Um, I drain my account pretty quickly. Um, okay. So I limit my exposure as much as I can. When it comes to storing my investments, I move them immediately to cold storage. Um, I'm also not that comfortable in Binance either. Um, no exchange really gives me the security I want. Maybe I should move over to Forex. I, are you comfortable with the funds you have on all Forex exchanges and um, it depends Other, on your broker. If, if they're regulated by a, a, a credible regulator, yes, I am. Yeah, well, we don't have any of that in crypto well, yet. Right, okay. Yeah, you're in the wild, wild west. So uh, it was really uh, fun talking to you. I hope you enjoyed hanging out with us for a little while today, Karush. And uh, two and a half years into trading, um, looks like you're off to a, an excellent start. And remember the difference between pros and amateurs are pros know how to lose. So they have money <laughs> left to be right with. Um, the great words, I'll note them down and make sure to trade by them. Yeah. And so uh, really thank you so much for your time and, and people could follow you. You want to give your Twitter handle out. So, you know, maybe there's some people that are hearing us live or possibly uh, watch the recording that may want to follow you on Twitter. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's just at Karush AK. Um, I occasionally share trade setups. I do a little bit of educational content and um, just share ideas. No particular product I sell, but um, I'd love for you guys to follow and interact with me. Well, may pips rain down on you like a monsoon, <laughs> Karush. And like it or not, you're my trading warrior brother now. Um, I very much like it. Thank you for having me. It's been a You're pleasure. Welcome, buddy. All right, everyone. That's a wrap. See everyone for Turnaround Tuesday. And remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. We'll see you tomorrow or see you in the chat room. Adios. Thanks again, Karoosh. Thank you.